Okay, members, we'll now resume the sitting, and uh, it's, t- it's time for questions to the first and deputy first minister. I call Steve Egan to ask the first question. Steve uh, Egan, question one, please. Gary Mogan, can call you, and with your permission, I'll take questions one, two, and three together. Following the EU's triggering of, triggering of Article 16 on the 29th of January, the First Minister and I requested a meeting with the European Commission Vice President Maros Sekovic. The meeting took place on the 3rd of February, and we appraised him of the current situation regarding the implementation of the protocol and its impact here. The meeting was constructive, and it led to an agreement to work together to address the remaining protocol issues. Following the meeting, the European Commission and the British Government released a joint statement confirming their commitment to the Good Friday Agreement and agreeing to use the joint committee structures to work intensively to find solutions to outstanding issues. This commitment to find solutions is very welcome, and I am pleased to see that it was reiterated again in the joint statement from the European Commission and the British Government following a further meeting on the 11th of February. The First Minister and I continue to attend meetings of the Joint Committee and will use its structures to ensure that our position is understood and to seek the best outcome for our citizens and for businesses. Concurrent with these ongoing discussions, we are continuing to work to identify, assess and seek to resolve immediate operational issues associated with the end of the transition period. The Department for the Economy, alongside InvestNI and Intertrade Ireland, are continuing to engage with many sectors to clarify the terms of access to the different markets and to encourage and enable export growth that can help drive our economic recovery. Supplementary, Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Deputy First Minister for her comments so far. Um, did Maria Sekovic give any indication that he was listening to the very legitimate concerns of the people of Northern Ireland, in particular those as of the unionist community, about the very invidious nature and divisive nature of the Irish Sea border itself and the fact that the protocol is part of the problem and not part of the solution? Well, I can confirm to the member that the Vice President of the Commission listened intently to what was said in the meeting, um, and further to that, actually, as you'll know, um, towards the end of last week, had a series of meetings with both business leaders, civic society leaders here, to listen to people's uh, concerns. And I welcome the fact that both the EU side and the British Government have recognised the need to implement the protocol, to iron out all the issues that have been, adre- that have been identified, and to find solutions. And that's where everybody's efforts should be right now, in trying to find solutions to give the businesses the clarity, the stability that, that they crave, and the certainty that they crave for the months ahead and, and what the, f- the future trading uh, patterns look like for them. What we're dealing with now is obviously the outworking of Brexit. Uh, there was always going to be major ramifications in terms of Brexit. Thankfully, we have a protocol that actually offers a solution to um, what is a huge problem. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, First Ministers, um, uh, just a few days ago, Invest NI said Northern Ireland can quote, become a gateway for the sale of goods to two of the world's largest markets. Uh, because of our unique position, we are at the hinge point of the British market and the EU, mar- EU single market of half a billion. Uh, First Ministers, what are we doing to maximise access? to maximise the benefits from the dual market access to create jobs and prosperity for people here, because we are in a unique position, envy not just from other parts of the United Kingdom, but across this continent. Well, just to say, I agree with the member in terms of the opportunity that we have, and we do have access to both markets, which is a strength, um, which would be obviously the envy of many others in terms of their ability to trade. So I think that uh, the fact that we have that access to £450 million in the EU market is something that we need to work on. I, I, I've said in the original answer that work is underway with the Department of the Economy, Invest NI, and also Intertrade Ireland, because I think it's important that they, they all work together to work with the sectors, to identify the markets, to work on, up on the opportunities. So we need to see more of that, and we need to use our unique position to, to attract jobs, to attract um, investment here large. Uh, there, there's huge um, opportunity, I think, for us. So what we need to see is the dedicated um, economic strategy coming forward from the Department of the Economy. And I know that over the course of today and tomorrow, this House is discussing um, economic strategy, and I look forward to, um, to all of that. But I think it's important that we do maximise uh, the benefits that we have and that we work with the business community, with traders, with retailers, and everybody else. We try to get the certainty on the, on the issues that require certainty, and then let's look for the opportunities. Call Archibald. 
Speaker Marga, can call you and I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Would the uh, First Minister uh, agree with me that the Executive should develop an overarching economic strategy to maximise the benefits from our continued access to the European single market and its 450 million consumers? Again, I thank the member for the question and I do think that, again, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to work to develop an, an overarching economic strategy that will take all the executive working together across every department. Um, it no, will not come as any surprise to the member that the, the disruption that we're experiencing right now, the difficulties that are being experienced, um, are as a direct consequence of Brexit, um, a Brexit that was rejected by the majority of um, people across this uh, community, but also the majority of people in this House. That's my, my own um, view. But I think that uh, for us as an executive, and um, for us as a, across this assembly, our collective effort must now be to focus um, on the opportunity to protect jobs, to protect livelihoods, and that's why we need to have the, the issues of the Joint Committee uh, providing solutions, and let, let's all work together to actually provide those um, solutions, and I think these are the opportunities that, that we have in front of us. I call Jim Allister. Does the Deputy First Minister accept that commerce between Great Britain and Northern Ireland has been impeded by the protocol whose, imp whose rigorous implementation she demands. Why, therefore, does she want to punish the economy of Northern Ireland? Or is the simple truth that dislocation between Northern Ireland and GB is a political gain that she prioritises above the damage? To our economy. Can I say that um, what we're experiencing right now is a direct consequence of Brexit, a Brexit which you, uh, the member, uh, championed and, and brought, helped to bring it about. So what we need to do now is actually find solutions to uh, the issues that are outstanding. I want to see freedom, uh, free trade right across north, south and east, west. I don't want to see any disruption to trade. Um, I think that's in our economic benefit that we have, uh, that that fr freely uh, flows. So what we need to all be focused on right now, instead of playing silly games, it needs to be about what provides certainty to businesses, to traders, to retailers, what provides the certainty, what, what gives stability, what, um, what can we simplify. So let's use the avenues that are open to us in the withdrawal agreement, and that is the Joint Committee. And I welcome the fact that it will meet um, before Wednesday, I believe, and I also hope that both myself and the Joint First Minister are in that meeting also, so we have an opportunity to put across uh, the, the need for, for the, the issues of stability, certainty and simplification. I call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, these issues are not caused by Brexit, but rather a denial of Brexit via pro, uh, protocol parties opposite. Some nine weeks into the Northern Ireland Protocol, can the Deputy First Minister point to any evidence, both anecdotal or substantial, that this protocol has any advantages for Northern Ireland businesses? Or is it a case that they just simply do not exist? And if so, would she join with me and others in calling out the protocol for what it is and ensuring that it is destined for the dustbin where it belongs? Um, my own personal view is um, thank goodness for the protocol. What we're, experiencing right now, what we're experiencing right now is the fact that the British government didn't prepare. They didn't work with businesses in, in terms of um, being ready for a post-Brexit world. They run the clock down to the 31st of December. There was no opportunity to transition into a new trading arrangement. What we're dealing with now is the new trading reality as a direct result of Brexit. So what this executive has to focus on, what this assembly needs to focus on, is actually ironing out the difficulties that have now arisen as a direct result of Brexit, is to work with the British government and the EU side to make sure we get solutions to those things. And then let's look towards the opportunities for the future and let's ensure that we uh, grab all those opportunities, that we help to create jobs and employment here, that we help our local industry uh, because there are new realities of trading patterns. So there's opportunities now for smaller businesses here who traditionally couldn't supply into, for example, some of the big supermarkets. How can we support them to make sure that they can do that? So that's where um, our efforts need to be focused. It's around stability, it's around certainty, and it's not around playing games with the protocol that has been agreed over the course of four years. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much to the Joint First Minister. Um, First, Joint First Minister, can I ask you what confidence our business community can have in an executive that's failing to be able to work together? How will the negotiations go if that relationship does fall apart, um, given the fact that the self-harm that Brexit has created to this place? 
We are dealing with um, a post-Brexit world, and the executive has no um, other option other than to work together. Um, everybody needs to be focused in the same direction, and that needs to be to iron out the issues that, that need to be resolved. There are things that are a direct result of the new trade in reality. There are things that are um, a direct result of the fact that, as I said, the deal wasn't struck right down to the wire, so um, people haven't had time to adjust. So there are, of course there are going to be issues, um, and they're genuine issues, from, particularly from a, a business point of view. So let's get the resolution to those. I look forward to the Joint Committee on, um, on Wednesday, and that gives us an opportunity to actually try to hopefully have some outcomes. So there are a number of issues that have been resolved. Um, the issue of steel, for example, there, are still, there was some um, clarity given there. There's a whole um, list of issues which we continually raise to try to get um, clar clarity on, and I welcome the fact that there has been progress, but there's surely there's definitely more to be done, and our job should be to just continue to find the solutions. I call Christopher Stafford. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the triggering of Article 16 by the European side was, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister would agree, a hateful, spiteful act by an incompetent, bungling European bureaucracy to disguise the fact that it had singularly failed to deliver a proper vaccine rollout for the people of continental Europe. But Article 16 has now been triggered. Would you agree with me that in future, UK governments should not be reticent about using it to defend our interests the way the European side did their own? Well, firstly, um, I would dissociate myself with your language completely. Um, secondly, I would say that um, what, what happened uh, on the EU side, whenever they said that they were going, indicated they were going to trigger Article 16, um, was wrong. I've said that publicly. It was wrong. Um, but you don't fight fire with fire. You don't fight back and say, well, you know, they threw their dummy out of the prams, so let's us do it too. Let's find solutions. Let's find solutions to the Brexit that's been foisted upon us by the Tories, which your party supported. And I call Nicola Brogan. Question number four, please. With your permission, can call you, Junior Minister Kearney will respond to this question. We want this to be a truly shared, equal and safe society for all of our people, regardless of race or ethnicity. Unfortunately, Racism and hatred remains an unwelcome presence in our society. The First Minister and I attended a meeting with the Racial Equality subgroup earlier this month. This reinforced the huge impact racism has on people's lives and how important it is that we continue in our efforts to tackle hatred and prejudice. We are doing that through the implementation of our racial equality strategy, Tackling racism and hate crime is the central aim of this strategy, and we remain fully committed to delivery of all the key actions within it. Progress has been made on a number of these. We have completed a review of the Minority Ethnic Diversity Fund to ensure that it best supports local groups to promote good relations between people of different ethnic backgrounds. We have reviewed the Race Relations Order and are now preparing options for enhancing the legislation. We will shortly be consulting on a draft refugee integration strategy. We are also currently considering the recommendations from Judge Maranand's report on hate crime legislation, and we very much look forward to seeing these implemented. Tackling hatred is the responsibility of us all in government and indeed wider society. And we will continue to drive forward this critically important work. Let me say once again, there is no place for hate, discrimination in our communities, and we will not tolerate racism in any form. We are committed to tackling these challenges, and it will take us all working together to deliver the positive change that is needed. Supplementary, Nicola Brogan. Thank you, um, we recently witnessed appalling racist remarks from a DUP MP who then refused to withdraw or apologise for such offensive comments. Would the Minister agree with me that um, comments like this not only run contrary to the objectives set out in the um, racial equality strategy, but also go against the Executive and this Assembly's opposition to any form of racism? Just last week, the, the First Minister, Junior Minister Middleton and myself met with the Racial Equality subgroup. And that group 
as I indicated, has specific responsibility to advise on the implementation of the Racial Equality Strategy 2015 to 2025. And speakers at that meeting recall their experiences of everyday racism. They also reflected on their experiences of institutional racism, critically intergenerational poverty, as it interconnects with the reality of racism, and also the effects of precarious employment and zero-hours contracts that have a disproportionate effect within our ethnic minority population. So it was a very sobering meeting at Kion Korya. In some respects, we might want to describe it as something of a reset moment, uh, if you like. Because contributors set out the task ahead if we are to build a future that values racial equality and also racial justice. Now, as for the, the songs of praise remarks by a senior DUP politician that you reference, it is clear to me that when senior politicians feel that that type of public commentary is acceptable, then we still have a way to go, uh, Mr. Speaker. The remarks were insulting and they were offensive, and, and I acknowledged that during our meeting with the racial equality subgroup. And those remarks contrast starkly with the future that we should all be seeking to build together. And just as they run contrary to the vision of the racial equality strategy owned by the executive, they also speak to the need for robust political leadership across this chamber to confront all forms of racism and to give leadership to build a community that is defined by inclusivity, which celebrates our diversity, is known crucially for its zero tolerance of racism and is renowned that this place becomes renowned as a welcoming place for everyone who has chosen to make this place their home. Marshan Achan Korya, ni mor da ahan kyanra san seal sahi agas palachiakta. An foda hyasu in Aden an Kenya has. And as a time's up. An shakta hish agas gak sai sa der yalu. Tor maigat. Tor maigat, thank you. And the call Colin McGrath. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a key component yet undelivered of the racial equality strategy is a refugee integration strategy. And given that today I was sent a social media ad for a vacant house in Northern Ireland that included the line, foreign nationals need not apply, where are we with this much needed integration strategy? Uh, and you, you raise a very important issue in relation to the, the progress of the, racial, uh, of the refugee integration strategy. So allow me to, uh, to set it into this particular context. Uh, work has progressed in this particular matter. And in order to get you the specifics, colleague, if you just bear with me. We, we have, in fact, advanced that. It's one of uh, our 11 particular themes within the racial equality strategy. It falls in the context of how we deal with uh, refugees and those who are asylum seekers in this place. Uh, we are engaged directly with the British Home Office in relation to the bringing forward of uh, their recommendations and views on this particular matter. But we have made it very clear that uh, we are acutely concerned with the potential implications that that would have for how we ensure that our uh, racial uh, minorities, our ethnic minorities, and those who have come to this place as both asylum seekers and as refugees are properly regarded, properly included, and are not in any way economically disadvantaged as a result of coming here to make this place their home. Well, Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I thank uh, the Minister for his answer so far, because I think it, it's, it's incumbent on us all for the racial equality strategy uh, to work to help with diversity within uh, this part of the, the United Kingdom. Uh, but can I ask the, the, the Minister, is, is that for many from the, the, the BME, and especially the newcomer uh, communities, um, they cannot avail of the rules around the common travel area. Um, could he explain what we're trying to do to, to rectify that particular issue? I thank the member for his question. 
Again, th this relates back to how we advance the work that we have taken forward in relation to our Minority Ethnic Development Fund. We have the Racial Equality uh, Strategy Overview, but we also need to be dealing specifically with those who are asylum seekers, who are refugees. And, and in that particular respect, um, our work is uh, engaged, as I mentioned in answer to the question posed by the previous colleague, with the British Home Office in relation to ensuring that uh, travel does not become an impediment to ensuring that people who need to come here to live in this place for fear of uh, famine, war and other forms of injustices are in fact brought here. They are included in this society. We have them fully integrated and that they enjoy the same benefits of living in this place as any other member of our society within the context of our racial equality strategy and all of the programmes and elements and priorities that that reflects. I call Mark Durgan. Uh, I can call you. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. There is a lasting concern that organisations run by people from our own traditional communities who work with BME people are favoured over organisations led by BME people whose groups are often told that they lack the capacity to administer government funding or to run programmes. However, it is one of the stated aims of the racial equality strategy is to build capacity for ethnic minority people. Can the Minister advise on how the distribution of resources between race relations and community relations is decided upon? Um, away has done call this up in case and occur. We have in place a racial equality subgroup. Uh, as I explained, myself and the First Minister uh, met with them just last week. It's a very representative group uh, of individuals. We think that uh, they are very representative of the constituencies and the communities which they, they represent. We can always do better. We had a very good engagement with them about the importance of the work that they are carrying forward. We need to be listening to what it is they are saying. It would be a huge anomaly uh, and completely counterintuitive if we had a situation where uh, those of us who are from here would purport to know best the needs of those who are members of our racial and ethnic minority population. I think that the fix for that is by staying very closely engaged with our racial equality subgroup, which is an integral part of our racial equality strategy, listening to what they have to say, and then ensuring that when we have access to resources uh, to build capacity, to build inclusion, to ensure that the rights of those minorities are protected, that, that is done in a way which is absolutely in consultation with the needs of those citizens on the ground, articulating their needs and ensuring they are properly represented and reflected through the racial equality subgroup. I call Dolores Kelly. Question five, Minister. <coughs> and, uh, can I, with your permission again, I will answer questions five, six and ten together. On the 9th of February 2021, the Court of Appeal ruled that the Executive Office is under a legal duty to fund victims' payments and lump sums under the Victims' Payment Regulations 2020. The ruling gave the Executive and the NIO four weeks to find an agreed solution. The First Minister and I remain entirely committed to delivering the scheme, and the Executive Office acknowledges that it needs to be funded to operate properly. Along with the Justice and Finance Ministers, the First Minister and I are engaged in correspondence with the Secretary of State in relation to funding and, follow our, and following our request for an urgent meeting with him to address this matter, the Secretary of State has now agreed to meet uh, to this meeting and it is taking place tomorrow, the 23rd of February. It remains our firm view that the scheme should be funded by the Westminster Government as an addition to the block grant. Without additional funding for the scheme to the block grant, the Executive will be faced with very significant funding pressures. We will continue to make this case directly. Such discussions will not prevent TEO in the meantime from making the necessary requests for funding from the Department of Finance as it falls due. The £2.5 million advanced by the Executive has enabled a dedicated project team to be established in the Department of Justice to progress the, and the development of delivery structures for the scheme, and a substantial programme of work is underway. Progress to date includes ongoing development of an online system to receive applications, the appointment of an interim victims payment board, the appointment by the DOJ of an assessment service provider, and accommodation has been secured for staff who will be delivering the scheme. Mr Justice Michael Linton has been appointed as Interim President of the Victims Payment Board. 
The proposed allocation of funding in the draft budget would provide £6.7 million in 2021-22 for administrative costs of the scheme, which demonstrates the Executive's commitment to delivery. Part of this funding will enable the victims and survivors sector to recruit additional staff to support applicants. Dolores Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the Deputy First Minister for her answer. Uh, um, the, the clock is very clearly running down in relation to this two weeks left. Are you telling me then you have a plan B, so to speak, in terms of getting everything in place? But will you have any money? Will the executive have any money uh, to pay uh, victims at the end of uh, in, at the end of March or May? And had, have you given any consideration? I mean, obviously this campaign was led by those who were severely physically injured, and subsequently those who suffered psychological damage uh, were then added on. I just wonder, would would you be in a position, if funding was available, to get money out quickly to those who have suffered? Uh, some of the most hurt on a, from physically. I thank the member for her question and can I say that you know it's our intention to try and get the scheme up and running and the payments out the door as quickly as possible. These people have waited for far too long to get to this point. Um, the, as you know, the court ruling has uh, made it very clear that we have to fund the scheme, but we believe that given the fact that the scheme in itself is so far. Uh, it's different compared to where we were in terms of the Stormont House Agreement and what was agreed at that stage. So, um, in terms of the British government's own funding policy, it must fund, um, fund things that it legislated for. So, in this case, uh, we hope that we get some progress from the meeting tomorrow um, with the Secretary of State. Let me call Roy Beggs. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this year, the Finance Minister reported there were considerable underfunding and a money that may actually be returned to Treasury unspent because of money is returned to him. Has the Executive Office been in touch with the Treasury to ensure that victims uh, are not disappointed once again, to ask whether, at the very least, that funding could be used to pay the first year of the uh, Victims of the Troubles uh, Disability Scheme? Can I just assure the member that our focus and attention is on to get the scheme up and running, to get applications in and to, get them, to have the, the payments made. Um, that is why we need to have this engagement with the um, Secretary of State tomorrow. And that includes a cross uh, group of ministers, our, our sales from the Executive Office. It is also finance and justice involved. And it is really, really important that uh, we have that meeting because we have been waiting for it for five months. Um, but it is really, really important that we have that discussion. Also, then, alongside that, the Finance Minister will, of course, on behalf of the Executive, continue to engage with the Treasury, also in terms of the funding of the scheme. I call Gemma Dolan. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, Minister, can you clarify, is it not the case that the British Government developed the scheme and therefore by their own Treasury rules that they must fund it? I'm always, I'm always very conscious, um, Can Corley, when I speak in this matter, that um, victims who are in need of the pension are listening to the debate. So let me speak um, directly to them. The executive is absolutely committed to paying uh, and delivering on this scheme. Um, how the scheme is resourced, however, is a political uh, question, and it's a question that needs that urgent focus from um, the British government and from Brandon Lewis in particular. It also requires an immediate um, political solution because, as I've said earlier, victims have had to wait for far too long. And I appreciate that the needs um, of, of victims who are waiting on this pension are immediate and they need to be addressed without any further delay. And I say that, as, as I said um, in a previous answer, that um, we have been asking for this meeting with Brandon Lewis since, uh, I think, last October. Um, and we now have that meeting tomorrow. But it's really important that there's an outcome to that meeting and that we have a chance to, uh, to actually have a, a real conversation around the funding of the scheme. Um, the Victims' Payment Scheme was designed in Westminster. Policy decisions were taken in Westminster about the scheme. And they have significantly increased the costs. Um, so, consistent with their own um, statement of funding policy, they also uh, ought to have made provision for the finances that are also required. Um, so, in terms of the cost of the scheme, I mean, compared to where it was initially uh, pitched and where it is today, it's, it's vastly different. Um, we've now received a report from the government's actuary department, which has used assumptions about numbers pro and provided by TEO to prepare for a range of costs. Estimates which range from 600 million um, at one end of the spectrum and 1.2 million, um, with a central estimate of about 848 million. So that shows the the, um, the level of challenge which um, this executive will have to face in terms of trying to fund um, this scheme, which is why we need the British government to uh, fund something which they themselves brought forward um, policy for and took policy decisions on. 
That ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the upcoming census, which is due to be carried out in the coming months, to provide us with an up-to-date, accurate record of all who will be eligible to vote at the next elections, that um, she and her party put out uh, false information across the media that this was simply an exercise being carried out solely to purge eligible voters off the register in Northern Ireland, which is factually incorrect. Would you now take this opportunity to correct that matter uh, on the floor of the House this evening? Well, firstly, um, the member will know that I'm speaking here as joint uh, head of government and as joint first minister. So uh, anything that the party does is an issue for, uh, if you want to address it politically with the party, that's fair enough. But let me say that the electoral office's role it should be to facilitate people to get registered to vote, to make it easy for people to exercise their franchise, um, and it should take part in the democratic process. So I think that uh, any particularly given the period that we're in um, right now, the fact that uh, normal procedures can't, couldn't be followed. If you wipe a register now, um, how will they be able to go door to door, for example, given the pandemic? So I think that there are real pragmatic um, issues here that need to be addressed, and I hope that the electoral office uh, take that on board. The canon, supplementary. Well, we thank the minister for her response, but she didn't take the opportunity, obviously, to withdraw the remarks that the party made and to apologise to people for the misinformation that the party put out, which seems to be a constant uh, drip of, uh, the, of that particular party? It's not a question, uh, Can Corlia, but just let me say that um, we here in the North know how important our vote is, given uh, the history of, of this place and the fact that so many people were denied their access to vote. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us in political office to ensure that um, you make it as easy as possible for people to participate in the democratic process. Nicole Emma Sheeran. Gormag, Ken I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Given the legal and human rights imperative to provide modern, accessible and compassionate abortion services here, do you agree that it is the sole responsibility of the Health Minister to implement these services? Well, in simple terms, the answer would be yes. Um, certainly, that's my view. Um, since the framework came into effect, there has been a legal responsibility on the Health Minister to ensure that he provides modern, compassionate health care. Uh, abo and abortion services and that they are provided via the health trust here. And I believe that his failure to do so is not only failing women who have a legal and a human right to compassionate health care services, but he is also failing his own health trust who have a right to expect leadership from, uh, from their minister. So women in, any, in, in no circumstance should not be compelled to travel to access vital health care services at any time, let alone um, during a global pandemic. So the minister should end the delays and fulfil his legal responsibilities to make these services available to women. Um, his failure to do so to date is totally unacceptable. Supplementary, Emma Sheeran. For my guest, Minister. The new legal framework, as you have outlined, for abortion services came into effect in March of last year. Would you agree that it is now long overdue that the Health Minister acted on this legal imperative, that he should stop delaying and now provide these services to which women are entitled immediately and without further delay? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that the, the framework and the legislation are, are crystal clear. It is the legal responsibility of the Minister for Health to ensure these services are provided. And the, the longer the delay is, the longer he's denying women their access to compassionate, modern and vital health care services. So this needs to end and the Minister must act. I call Michelle McElveen. Speaker, um, given the positive news today from Scotland in relation to data, which demonstrates that the rollout of the vaccination programme has led to a significant reduction in the number of people being hospitalised, is the Deputy First Minister in a position to confirm this type of data will be included in future modelling to inform decisions to move Northern Ireland out of the current restrictions more quickly? Thanks to the member. I, I haven't seen the data, so I, I can't comment on that per se, but I can say that and we've always had the view that the health uh, department should put all this information out into the public domain. There's a fair degree of information shared um, on the Department of Health's website, but I think that when it comes to us making these decisions um, and, and, and bringing the public with us, the more information we can put into the public domain, the better to help people understand uh, the pathway of the, of the, of the virus and trends and patterns and then actually how that informs our decision making. So my general answer would be just that we should put everything into the public domain that we can.
Supplementary, Michelle McElveen. Okay, thank you. And I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. We're all aware that work is ongoing to produce a pathway out of lockdown, and the Deputy First Minister should know that people are mindful of the need to protect lives and, and, and the health service, but they're also weary. Will she give a commitment that this will be meaningful, detailed, unambiguous, and with clear targets? Yes, I think it's really, really important that uh, we do. I set out the pathway and as the member um, hopefully is aware that both myself and the First Minister intend to present that to this chamber um, next week, hopefully on Monday. And we very much want to give the public the, the, the route map, um, how we're going to reverse out of the current restrictive uh, measures which we have in place. So I think that everybody's looking for some hope and want, they're, want, they're looking towards the future. We want to spell that out for people and it needs to be a step-by-step -step process. But there's no uh, doubt in my mind that it needs to be a, a gradual. Uh, it's, it's going to be slow and steady um, in terms of lifting of restrictions. But with the rollout of the vaccine um, in, in place now and the fact that it's working so well, uh, and we commend all those that are involved in delivering the vaccine, that combined with um, keeping the, the virus suppressed for as long as possible, then we need to uh, chart out for people what the future looks like, and we hope to do that next week. I call Jim Allister. Given that not once but twice the High Court has had to call out the Executive Office on the failures in respect of the um, victim's pension, and very pointedly in the first uh, case made criticisms, criticisms personal to the Deputy First Minister. Would you like to take this opportunity to apologise to innocent victims for the added hurt and trauma that all of this delay at her insistence has caused them. Can I say that, again, this is a very sensitive issue and we should be very mindful uh, in the normal political discourse and we can you know, uh, go at each other politically. We can, you know, we, we look, obviously, yourself and myself will never see eye to eye on, on many given issues, if not all. But I think that when it comes to the issue of victims' um, pension, people need to be very sensitive to the issue. These people have waited for far too long to get their pension. Um, I am committed to doing everything I can to make sure they get that, that uh, payment as quickly as possible. But the political reality is that uh, it was Westminster that took policy decisions um, that are far advanced from wh where we politically had agreed um, previously. Uh, therefore, it is incumbent upon them to also resource that, because the challenge, like I talked about, the, the costs and the fact that um, we could be looking at a, a central estimate of um, £848 million. That is a lot of, of uh, financial resource that this executive would have to bear the brunt of if, if, um, if the British government are not forthcoming with finances. That would put this whole executive uh, and assembly in a very, very difficult position because uh, we would have to take the money from health, we would have to take it from education, we would have to take it from all the other um, public services. So I am very focused on getting a solution. I am very focused on um, trying to uh, find the, the money and I am very, very focused on making sure that these people do not have to wait for a moment longer. Supplementary, Jim Allister. All those words, the minister is unable to say sorry to them, not for the first time. Could I ask her, are we now in a position where who gets the pension is being abandoned as a stalling tactic? Has the Deputy First Minister come to the realisation that that issue is settled and will not be used any further as a stalling tactic? The victim's pension should be paid to all those people, every single last person who has been um, directly impacted in the conflict. So anybody who has received um, injury should be, should be um, able to and be eligible for this scheme. So I, I do believe that there's a whole cohort of people that have been actually left out of this scheme, and I know that they will um, fight this case in, in the courts, and I support them in doing so, because they are equally entitled um, to get a pension. So, as I said previously, my focus, my priority is making sure that we get the pension paid. My focus and priority is making sure that the victims are no longer, um, that the, the payment is no longer delayed and the British government must uh, step up and actually resource something which they themselves took policy decisions in regards to. I call Paul Given. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will join with me in commending uh, the rollout of the vaccination programme here in Northern Ireland and the numbers in which people have now received the vaccine heading towards a third of our population. And that is replicated right across the United Kingdom. 
How concerned is the Deputy First Minister, however, though, that in the Republic of Ireland we are looking at still only around 5 to 6 per cent of the population haven't been vaccinated, and how much of a threat is that to the people of Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly look forward to the day when all of the people who live on this island and across these islands and globally receive the vaccine. There's no room for any sort of nonsense or global nationalism or, or sorry, vaccine nationalism, which I've heard described. I mean, this, we're in a global pandemic. If there's ever a time for us to work in a global effort, then this is it. So I, I look forward to the day whenever we are all um, vaccinated and we actually get back to some sense of normality and people um, are, are um, allowed again the opportunity to be with their family, to be with their friends, to, to go about their daily business without the fear that comes with living in a pandemic. Supplementary, Paul Gibbon. <coughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of reopening our economy, and as you said uh, this morning, you're wanting to have a pathway to recovery to protect families, workers and businesses, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, uh, and let us have these restrictions removed from us as soon as possible and practically to do so in line with the health guidance. However, the Republic of Ireland has put in place enforcement against the people of Northern Ireland travelling in the Republic of Ireland, and yet we are a much safer country now in terms of our population. Is there any reciprocal enforcement being planned by this executive to protect our return to normality because of the Republic of Ireland's failure in vaccinating its people? The message across the board, actually across both these islands, is to stay at home. That remains the case, even um, as you know, measures are announced around uh, what a pathway to recovery could look like, um, what opening up things again might look like. The message for now, and we're still in the middle of dealing with this pandemic, is to, to stay at home. So people shouldn't be travelling anywhere. Well, that is from Clonoe, where I live, in, in, to, to Belfast, to, to um, Dublin, to Cork. People should stay at home. That is the message. That remains the message. We're still in the middle of this pandemic. We're still dealing with a very uh, challenging situation. Uh, we need to, whilst things are going in the right direction, and, it, and it, that looks good, but if we don't keep this virus suppressed for a period of time, then we're going to keep coming back to this yo-yo scenario of in and out of lockdowns, and that's not where we want to be. So what we need to see is a steady... Uh, steady progress. Um, we want to publish the pathway next, next week, and I think that's really, really important to give the public an understanding of what the future looks like. I call Melissa McHugh and just to advise the member that you'll only have time for your question. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Carla, uh, I, uh, as an executive flagship project, can you provide an update on the importance of uh, resolving the delay to the Casement Park development? Thanks uh, to the member for his question. And obviously, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Casement is a crucial project, um, not just for, for Gales, but for this executive, because it is a, a flagship project um, for some time. So therefore, the delay needs to be ended as soon as possible. And the Finance Minister, I'm glad to say, has included uh, £20 million in the budget for the development. So um, what we need to now see, because it's disappointing that we still haven't uh, had the plan application completed, but I would expect the Infrastructure Minister will now work to ensure that there is no more delays. Um, it's more than 10 years since the uh, casement project was announced, so it's time to return at Chris casement to the, the, the shining beacon for Gales and Antrim, but for wider uh, the economic benefits it will bring to, to Belfast and, and actually, I suppose, to Ulster as well. Time is up. Could I ask members to take a raise, please, for a moment or two?